Good morning. It's time for Daily Chapel at the LCMS International Center in St. Louis. The text is Revelation chapter 16, verses 17 through 21. The Reverend Dr. John Sias is preaching. The broadcast of Chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. A reading from the Revelation to St. John, the 16th chapter. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth, so great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, about one hundred pounds each, fell from heaven on people. And they cursed God for the plague of the hail, because the plague was so severe. O Lord, have mercy upon us. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Synod today commemorates the prophet Elisha, understudy and successor to Elijah the prophet, and the finisher or closer of what Elijah was ordained to do. But, of course, he was first taken up into heaven in the fiery chariot. Second Kings 2 tells us, really without any commentary, that a mob of small boys jeered the newly mantled prophet Elisha with words that are memorable to me anyway. Go up, baldy. Go up, baldy. Caught up in a zeitgeist, not fond of prophets, it seemed that they wished another old man prophet to get lost his work largely undone. But Elisha, it says, turned, and seeing them, cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. This happened. Second Kings 2 comments no further. We could, I suppose, applying the catechism, we should fear and love God that we do not despise preaching and his word, or we might be torn by angry mama bears. God's glory is here vindicated as over Pharaoh, so over mobs of obstreperous preacher-despising youth. At the same time, we should fear and love God so that we do not curse. For who knows in our casual cursing if the she-bears might come, the power of God's name being what it is. Ought mercy not triumph? The wrath of man working not the righteousness of God? Well, in 2 Kings 2, there's no comment. It happened, speaking apparently for itself, and Elisha just moves along. And he, and not so much for this, but for other things, I suppose, is commemorated today. A speaker of God's word, a doer of his will, even in a time when its power and necessity and opposition to it were so manifest. And so he was a sign of the great prophet who was to come and did, who is, and who comes again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Well, what happened between Elisha and the boys may portend to the seventh bowl of wrath. Treaded out the vineyard where the grapes of wrath were stored, he looked for good grapes and it yielded only bad, this sad old world. And with six full cups already poured out, this seventh, is how Babylon the Great, which is all the world's proud self-deception, self-aggrandizement civilized, how she is made to drink it to the bitter end. Unlike Elisha and the boys and the she-bears, it's not without commentary. The angel and the altar have said round about the third cup, just and true are your judgments, O God. It is what they deserve. At the same time, we, whose sons and selves have, I suppose, despised a few preachers and not a little preaching, and so find the she-bears just a little bit over the top, we may also, 
having rather enjoyed some of the features of that great Babylon, if not the whole program, we might find these hundredweight hailstones all out of proportion. Have they really been so bad as to deserve all of this? Boils, blood for salt water, then for fresh scorching sun, then deep darkness, the paving of the way to Armageddon, and now these hundredweight hailstones? The situation was already, in modern terms, so unsustainable. Indeed, the voice says, it is done. And there are three things on that little word I think deserving commentary this morning. First, the word bears finality for this sad old world and its ways. There will be no more keeping on. The powers of man, supposedly, to reform himself, to refine and redefine humanity, to civilize the nations, to predict and restore and curtail and control creation, to reign supreme by his will, will fail. Man will not long have his cake and eat God's too, will not long control the uncontrollable, engineer some way to keep standing with his favored sins before the wrath of the holy God kicking harder against the goads, buying bigger helmets, building deeper foundations will only make it worse. And it must come to an end. It's already good as done. Second, done also at that point is the working of God's wrath in the world. There's a certain patience in measured punishment, a hope of reform, of repentance, but patience can last only so long. Any parent knows. These boys that encountered Elisha, maybe their parents had warned them not to despise preaching in God's word. Maybe they didn't spare the rod, but the child spoiled anyway. Or maybe they were just lousy parents and the children suffered for it. But which of us can deny that if we read the signs? The chastening wrath of God before it gets to that seventh bowl and hundredweight hail is mercifully very measured. I have cursed rashly. Not that Elisha did, I don't know, but I have. I've despised preaching, not a few preachers. Fortunately, pangs of conscience or faithful if sharp rebuke have come, thank God, with repentance, before she-bears made it out of the woods. But wrath alone doesn't turn us. And measured or not, it has an end, a limit. With the hundredweight hail, that's about all it can do. And still, men do not repent but curse God because the hail is so severe. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God, James says. Neither does the wrath of God. There comes a point when it too has done all it can do. It's done. But third... Done is less than finished. These things have come to pass. It's done, the voice says in the vision. The same is said of the new heavens and the new earth when they come in Revelation 21. These things have come to pass. It's done. And having seen these things in the vision and John told them of us, they are both as good as done to us, even though they are yet to come. But one thing is already, by a better word, finished. Done speaks to some event to be expected. Finished speaks to purpose accomplished. Design realized. A designer's essence made plain. Something not just to be expected, but to be believed. The ultimate purpose of God is not in fully and finally punishing the evil. Any more than it is in fully rewarding or even reforming the good. And much less is his purpose in us achieved by our sitting around and waiting for him to finish the one or the other or both. For what will be the end if we wait for God's wrath to consume our enemies, counting ourselves surely to be God's only true friends? Wrath has an end to what it can do, and so does our self-made, self-measured righteousness. Repent. Repent and believe the gospel. 
For against that assuredly disappointing wait for those things to be done with nothing else, our Lord Jesus, to whom all the prophets and apostles point, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his own blood, has said, it is finished. And of what he finished there, we sang earlier in the hymn. Outside that cross, all is futility. Every road ends in done. No measure of man's wealth or boldness or self-righteousness will stand man as he is or wants to be up before the wrath of God. At the same time, no amount of God's wrath by itself is going to renew a single man. But in that cross finished is the fullness of God's aim for and in and through all, that every man, with every other avenue done, believe the forgiveness of sins by Jesus' blood and be saved. For the one justified by his blood is saved by him from the wrath of God. And for so much more, new heavens and a new earth, good is done. Now, like Elisha and like John the Revelator, we are in a time when the power and necessity of God's word, of God's law, and the warning of the wrath that is to come, but also the word of what the Christ has finished for us and for all in his cross, and the opposition to all of the above, these are manifest in our day, too. These things John sees are good as done. They will be poured out. But now, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son of what he has done in himself for us and as the proper end of all things, their purpose. It is finished. Even, therefore, as we look toward these last things, let us instead focus in our life and conversation all the more on the thing that will be decisive then, the one thing, namely what is finished now. And the righteousness of God that is through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, be yours through faith in that cross and theirs. May God grant it to and through you now and for that day when all else is done. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Thank you for joining us for chapel. Today we pray for Chaplain Jeremy Gorline, who is deployed. The broadcast of chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. To learn more about LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces, visit kfuo.org chapel.